I don't know why I'm standing here. That was the, the best introduction I could think of for Ursula, so I'll just let her sit there and talk to you. That's a, that's a pretty hard act to follow, you know. <laughs> well, I'm, when I was in Sydney a couple of weeks ago, I made a very rash promise um, to Bill Wright, who was obviously not a man to be trusted. I said if he could turn up a beanie hat, I'd wear it for the speech. <laughs> The trouble is, I can't, I can't talk off the top of my head. I have to read the speech, and when I bend my head over, the, the beanie falls off. So <laughs> I, uh, well, I just want to start out by, by thanking you all for having me here. Uh, especially, I want to thank the Australia Council, the Literature Board, for putting on that beautiful workshop, and Robin and the rest of the committee for looking after me. And most of all, John Bangson for thinking of this whole silly idea in the first place. Well, I want to start out with a, a serious question to you all, which is what on earth are we all doing here? I think, I think we've come here to celebrate. This is, this is a celebration. This is what the word means, I suppose. It's coming together of a lot of people from all kinds of weird places, away from their customary life, often at some trouble and expense maybe not knowing very precisely why they come, but, but uh, moved to come to one place together to celebrate. And a celebration doesn't need any cerebration, it doesn't need any excuses. A celebration is its own reason for being, as you find out once you get there. I think a celebration such as this has its own reasons and its own strange laws and, and lifespan. It's a real thing, it's an event, and, and we hear afterwards in our own separate ways and lives. We're going to look back on it and recall it as a whole. And if there were some bad moments in it, if some of us got drunk and some of us got angry and some of us had to make speeches and <laughs> other of us got very bored at the speeches and <laughs> still I think the chances are that, that we'll look back on it with some contentment because the essential element of a celebration is praise and praise comes out of joy. And when you come right down to it, we've all come here to enjoy ourselves. We're not going to accomplish anything, you know, or establish anything, or sell anything. Uh, we didn't come here to make a new law, or to declare a war, or to fix the price per barrel of crude oil. And thank God we didn't. There are enough people doing that sort of rubbish. I think we came here to meet each other in hopes and some confidence that we'll like each other. We're here to enjoy ourselves, which means we're doing one of the most human of all doings, the, the search for joy, not the pursuit of pleasure. Any hamster can do that. <laughs> but the search for joy, and may I wish to you all here that you find it. But what is it that brings this particular us here, these particular peculiar individuals from unearthly places like Canberra and Oregon, all here, standing on our heads in Melbourne. <laughs> what are we celebrating here? Joy is a little bit vague. You have, to, you have to put your finger on it. And I put out my finger, and uh, what is it that I touch? Science fiction, of course. That's what brought us here. It does seem a rather bizarre motive, but it's no odder than the motive that brings together international conventions of manufacturers of plumbers' supplies. <laughs> or summit conferences of heads of states discussing how to achieve parity and overkill. <laughs> Science fiction is the motive and the subject of our celebration, and it's one point where all our different minds and souls touch, though on every other subject in the world we may be miles, light years apart. Each of us here has a soul button, I think. It's, it's like a belly button, but it's in the soul. You know. It's labeled SF. Now, many people do not have soul buttons. They only have belly buttons. <laughs> but we have soul buttons, and if you put your finger out and you touch that button, the whole spiritual console lights up and goes zzz, blink, all systems go, all systems go. 
Now, I'm your guest of honor, and very much honored to be so. And as such, I felt that I wasn't only to speak to you, but for you, to be the oracle, the, the leader of the celebration, the, the priestess of the cult. <laughs> I understand that when the last orgy is over, I'm to be led forth and thrown into the nearest volcano <laughs> to propitiate the fertility gods of Melbourne. <laughs> but I think the nearest volcano is a pretty good ways away. <laughs> so long as I'm here, I think my job is to speak for you, to celebrate what we're celebrating, to speak in praise of science fiction. And that's something I don't mind doing a bit. I like science fiction. And I have reason to be grateful to it. For the past dozen years or so, science fiction has added money to the family pocket and confusion to the family income tax return books to the family bookshelf and a whole sort of parallel universe dimension to the family life. Where's Ma going this month? Australia. You mean I have to wash the dishes for a week? No, we get to come along. Can I have a pet koala? Can I? I promise to feed it myself. Do you people realize, by the way, that to my three children, science fiction is not a low form of literature involving little green men and written by little contemptible hacks. It's an absolutely ordinary, respectable, square profession. It's the kind of thing your own mother does. <laughs> Now, most of us here, those over 25 anyway, we read science fiction when young and we hid our copy of Galaxy inside our copy of Intermediate Algebra you know, <laughs> in order to seem respectably occupied. We asked the children's librarians for SF and they said, oh, we do not allow children to read escapist literature. <laughs> and we asked the adults librarians for it and they said, oh, we do not carry children's books on this side of the building. <laughs> And we put the books down in you know, open to hide the cover which showed the purple squid with the maiden in the bronze <laughs> bra. You know. We had the difficulty, we had the pleasure of doing something which, if not actually illicit, was sneaky and eccentric and addictive and disreputable. Now, you know, our kids, not just my kids, but all our kids, everybody here that's too young to have any business having any kids, the rising generation, is almost entirely missing this experience. The poor things have nothing disreputable left but sex and marijuana. And sex is getting respectable all too soon. People are getting taught science fiction in the schools. Some of them may be hiding their copy of intermediate algebra inside a copy of, again, <laughs> Dangerous Visions. Now, I gather this co-option of science fiction into the curriculum is less usual in the Commonwealth than it is in America. But I was in England in January, and I got stuck on a telly spot. With, there were some Womblies, too. <laughs> but there were five beautiful Cockney kids from a Marylebone school, and they'd read more science fiction than I had. They'd done a whole school session reading and writing science fiction. So it's coming. In the States, it has come, and from St. Pancras Station to the farthest cheap station is coming. Science fiction is being taught by teachers and professors in schools and colleges. Science fiction is being seriously discussed by futurologists with computers and by literary critics with PhDs. Science fiction is being written by people who don't know Warp 5 from a Dyson sphere. <laughs> it's being read by people who don't read science fiction. <laughs> I am here to proclaim unto the assembled faithful that the walls are down the walls are down, we're free. And you know what? It's a big, cold world out there. I can't blame those of my generation and older who don't want to see the walls come tumbling down and who cling to their ghetto status as if it were a precious thing, making a religion out of science fiction which the touch of the uninitiated will profane. They were forced into that attitude by the attitude of respectable society intellectual and literary towards their particular interest. And it was perfectly natural for them, like any persecuted group, to make a virtue of their necessity. I don't blame them, but neither can I agree with them. 
to cling to a posture of evasion and defense once persecution and contempt has ceased is not to be a rebel but to be a cripple. And what I'd like to see is science fiction to continue to rebel. I'd like to see science fiction evade not those who despise it but those who want it to be just what it was 30 years ago. I want to see science fiction step over the old walls and head right into the next wall and start to break it down too. Now one of those walls is the labeling of books by publishers as science fiction. Labeling, packaging, and distributing. At the moment this is pretty much a necessity of the publishing trade. It's sensible. I don't expect an immediate rejection of the practice. Public librarians and school librarians and booksellers want to shelve and display science fiction so that those who want it can find it. It's convenient for us addicts and it's profitable to the booksellers and publishers. But the practice does considerable wrong to the innocent non-addict who's prevented from picking up a science fiction book by chance. He has to go to shelf 63 between the gothics and the softcore porn, you know, and look for it. And of course the science fiction label perpetuates a dichotomy that no longer exists between science fiction and mainstream. There's a spectrum now, there's not a chasm. The science fiction label is a remnant of the ghetto wall and I'll be glad to see it go. I'll be glad to see the day when I can go into any library and find the man in the high castle, not shelved next to Barf the Barbarian by Elmer T. Hack, but shelved by author's name Philip K. Dick right next to Charles Dickens where it belongs. <laughs> and another day like that, the day when the Times Literary Supplement or the New York Times Book Review or the East Grong Grong Sheep Ranchers Weekly. <laughs> there is a town called Grong Grong. <laughs> That's a workshop in joke too, but never mind. When, when the reviewers review a major new science fiction novel along with the other novels, not in a little box set apart headed sci-fi or spec thick or whatever they're calling it now, in which boxes and columns it's implied that however highly praised the work may be, it's not to be placed in the same category, of course, as the other novels reviewed throughout the paper, the real ones. There's a lot of walls yet to, to be reduced to rubble. But what I've been talking about is a bit external. The worst walls are never the ones you find in the way. The worst walls are the ones you put there. You build them yourself. This was said on the panel this afternoon. I was jumping up and down and cheering quietly. The walls you build yourself are the high ones and the thick ones with no doors in. All right, so here we stand. We are science fiction, a noble figure standing among the ruins, chains dropping from our giant limbs, facing the future with eagle eyes. But uh, actually, who are we and what future are we facing with our eagle eyes? Now that we're free, where are we going? Well, from here on, I have to speak as a writer. I've been trying to speak for the community of SF writers and fans, and I've been enjoying it, but I can't keep it up. I'm faking. I am not a fan. You know, many science fiction writers are or were. They, they started as fans. It was, I think, particularly a phenomenon of the ghetto, which is now called the Golden Age. <laughs> I came along just late enough to miss the Golden Ghetto. I didn't even know it existed. I read science fiction as a kid, but I didn't know anything about fandom. I wrote science fiction first. I discovered it was science fiction second when the publishers told me so. And then finally third, I discovered the existence of fandom. That was in Oakland, California in 1964, which I think was the first big world con. I, I was in Berkeley and I heard there was this science fiction thing going on. And I'd published three or four science fiction stories, and I was crazy about Phil Dick and Cordwainer Smith and people, and so I went down to Oakland to see what was going on. And there were about 5,000 people there, and they all knew each other, and they knew absolutely everything about science fiction since 1926. <laughs> and the only one I met was Barbara Silverberg, and she was so incredibly gorgeous that I went home and put my head in a paper bag for a week. <laughs> That was the last world con I attended until this one. <laughs> you see, I'm an outsider. I, I'm an alien. 
for all you know, I come from a different galaxy, and I am here planning the overthrow of the entire Australian ballot system. <laughs> Got some supporters on that one, huh? <laughs> But all the same, I do write science fiction, and that's, I guess, why you asked me here. And so I think it would make sense if I went on and spoke as what I am, a writer, a writer of science fiction, a woman writer of science fiction. You know, I am a very rare creature. My species was at first believed to be mythological, like the Tribble and the Unicorn. Members of it survived by protective coloration and mimetic adaptation. They used male pen names. And then slowly and timorously, like platypuses, you know, they began to come out of hiding, looking around warily for the predators. I was forced into hiding once myself by an editor of Playboy who reduced me to a simple, unthreatening, slightly enigmatic shape, a you. Not Ursula, but you. <laughs> I've felt a, felt a little bit bent, a little bit U-shaped ever since then. But we kept creeping out. It, it took a while and there were setbacks, but gradually my species took courage and appeared in full mating plumage. Anne, Sonia, Kate, Joanna, Vonda, Susie, and the rest. But when I say the rest, please don't alarm, don't feel threatened or anything. There aren't very many of us. Maybe one out of 30 science fiction writers is a woman. That statistic was supplied by my agent, Virginia Kidd, who's a very beautiful member of my species. The ratio is a guess, but it's an educated guess. Do you find it a little startling? Because I do. I'm extremely puzzled. I'm even embarrassed by my own rarity. Are they going to have to lock me up in pens, you know, like the platypuses and the whooping cranes and other species threatened with extinction and watch eagerly to see if I lay an egg? <laughs> Why are women so scarce in science fiction, in the literature, among the fans, and most of all among the writers? Some historical reasons come to mind. American science fiction as action pulp fiction during the 30s, and Campbellian science fiction written for adolescent engineers. But <laughs> those are all circular reasons. Why was golden ghetto science fiction males only? Is there something in the nature of the literature that doesn't appeal generally to women? Well, not that I can see. Uh, Campbell's analog in its school certainly did follow one minor element within science fiction to the extreme, to a point where only those who really enjoy wars or wiring diagrams can enjoy it very much. Most women in our culture have been brought up to be fairly indifferent towards military heroics and wiring diagrams, so they're likely to be bored. They're used to being cut out. Juvenile males in most cultures tend to be afraid of women and to form clubs that cut them out and exclude them. Similarly, a good deal of sword and sorcery leaves most women cold because it consists so much of male heroics and male fantasies of sexual prowess, often very sadistic. But you set aside those two minor provinces for the Boy Scouts, and you got all the rest left, all this beautiful countryside of grown-up science fiction, where anything can happen and usually does. Why haven't more women moved in and made themselves at home? I don't know. My trouble is I was born here. I didn't move in. I've always been here, so I can't figure out what the problem is. Year by year, I see more members of my species, mostly young ones, coming and building temporary nests and trying out their wings above the mountains. But not enough. 20 or 30 males to one female is not a good ratio for species preservation. You know, among hens, it goes the other way. You need half a dozen hens for one rooster. But I just want to ask the men here to consider idly in some spare moment whether by any chance they've been building any walls to keep the women out or to keep them in their place and what they may have lost by doing so. And to ask the women here to consider idly or not at all idly, why are there so few of us? We can't blame it on prejudice, because in SF publishing, there's very little sex bias. <laughs> Have women walled themselves out through laziness of mind for fear of being seen using the intellect in public, or fear of science and technology, or fear of letting their imagination go, or perhaps fear of competing with men? That, as we all know, is an unladylike thing to do. 
But art is not ladylike or gentlemanly. It's not masculine and it's not feminine. The reading of a book, the writing of a book, isn't an act that's dependent in any way upon one's gender. In fact, very few human acts other than procreation and gestation and lactation are. When you undertake to make a work of art, a novel or a clay pot or what have you, you're not competing with anybody except yourself and God. Can I do it better this time? And once you've realized that's the only question, once you've faced the empty page or the lump of clay in that solitude, without anybody to blame for failure but yourself, once you've known that fear and that challenge, you aren't going to care very much about being ladylike or about your so-called competition, male or female. The practice of an art is in its absolute discipline, the experience of absolute freedom. And that, above all, is why I'd like to see more of my sisters trying out their wings above the mountains, because freedom is not always an easy thing for women to find. Well, so I've got one fact about who and what science fiction is. It's very largely male, but seems to be tending always a little more towards androgyny, at least I hope so. And what else is well, Theodore Sturgeon once remarked that it's 95% trash, <laughs> like everything else. I trust you know Sturgeon's law. But I'm, I'm in a bad mood tonight. I, I want to question Sturgeon's law. Is 95% of everything trash? Is 95% of a forest trash? Is 95% of the ocean trash? Well, it will be if we go on polluting it. But, but uh, is 95% of humanity trash? Any dictator will agree, but I don't agree with it. Is 95% of literature trash? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it is. Of the books now published in the world in a year, 95% probably aren't even trash. They're just noise. But I want to go back to speaking as a writer, not a reader, and inquire how many books, while they are being written, are conceived of by their author as trash? Because I think that's the real question here. And it's an interesting question. I have no idea what the answer is. It's not zero percent. It's far from it. There are plenty of authors who deliberately write junk for money. And I've met many who, less cynical, still speak of their own works as pot boilers or as mere entertainment, a little defensively, because the ego is always involved in the work, but also honestly, in the full knowledge that they hadn't done and hadn't tried to do the best work they could. And I think in art, from the artist's point of view, there are only two alternatives, the best you can do or trash. It's a binary system. It's yes, no, on, off. Not from the reader's point of view. From the reader's point of view, there are infinite gradations between the best and the worst, all degrees of genius and talent and achievement, between Shakespeare and the hack, and within each work, even Shakespeare's work. But from the writer's point of view, what I'm trying to say, while he's writing, there are just two ways to go, to push towards the limit of your capacity or to sit back and emit garbage. And the really unfair thing about all this is that the intent, however good, guarantees nothing. You can try your heart out. You work like a slave. You try to do your best and you can write dribble. But the opposite intent does carry its own guarantee. No artist ever set out to do less than his best and did something good by accident. It doesn't work that way. You head for perfection and you may very well get trash. But you head for trash and by gum you get it. The quest for perfection fails about 95% of the time, but the search for garbage never fails. <laughs> now, I find this repetition of the trashiness of most science fiction too easy. It's both defensive and destructive. It's defensive. It's, don't hit me, folks, I'm down already. That's the old ingratiating ghetto attitude. And it's destructive because it's cynical. It sets limits. It builds walls. It says to the science fiction writer, of all people, why shoot for the moon? Chances are 19 to 1 you won't get there. Only a tiny elite gets there, and we all know that elite people are snobs, right? Keep your feet on the ground. Work for money, not for dreams. Write it the way the editor says he wants it. Don't waste time revising it and polishing. Sell it quick. Grind out the next one. 
What the hell, it's a living, isn't it? So what if it's not art, at least it's entertainment? Now that's the bit that burns me. That entertainment bit, it hides a big lie behind an obvious truth. Of course an, a science fiction story is entertainment. All art is entertainment. That's so plain, it's, it's silly to keep saying it. If Handel's Messiah were boring, not entertaining, would thousands of people go listen to it year after year at Christmas and Easter? If the Sistine ceiling were dull, would, would everybody go there and get a crick in their neck looking at it? If Oedipus Rex weren't a good show, would it be in the repertory after 2,500 years? If the First Circle weren't a terrifically powerful and entertaining book, would the Soviet government be so scared of it? If Solzhenitsyn were a dull hack, they'd love him. He'd be writing what they want. He'd be writing to the editor's specifications. He'd be perfectly safe. He'd probably be a people's artist by now. Now, of course, some art is immediately attractive and some is very difficult, demanding an intense response and involvement from its readers. The art of your own time tends to be formidable in a time of change like ours because you have to learn how and where to take hold of it, what response is being asked of us before we can get involved with it. It's really new and therefore it's a bit frightening. I'm very easily frightened. I was even afraid of the Beatles when they first appeared. People are easily frightened, but they're also brave and stubborn. They, they want that entertainment that only art can give them. And they, it's, it's a peculiar, solid satisfaction. And, and so they will keep going and listening to weird electronic music. And they'll go stare at <coughs> big, ugly paintings of blobs, you know. And they'll read these funny, difficult books about people on another world 20,000 years from now. And they go home and they say, well, yeah, I didn't really like it. It's, it's unsettling. It's, it's painful. It's crazy. But, you know, I kind of like that one piece where I went, boing. it got to me, you know. Well, now, that's all art wants to do, I think. It wants to get to you, to break down the walls between us as people for a moment, to bring us together in a celebration, a, a ceremony, an entertainment a mutual affirmation of understanding or of suffering or of joy. Therefore, I nastily oppose the notion that you can put art over here on a pedestal and entertainment down here in a clown suit. Art and entertainment are the same thing. The more deeply and genuinely entertaining a work is, the better art it is. To say that art is something heavy and dull and solemn and entertainment is modest but jolly and popular, that's neo-Victorianism, it's idiocy. Every artist is deeply serious and passionate about his work and every artist also puts on a clown suit and capers for pennies. The fellows who put on the, the clown suit but who don't care about performing well, they're neither entertainers nor artists, they're fakes. They know it and, and we know it. They may be very popular briefly because they never frighten anybody. They reassure people by lying to them. But when the popularity blows over, the work's forgotten, what's left? You're left with a sort of a hollow place, a sense of waste, a realization that where something real could have been done, a good handsome clay pot or a good entertaining story, the chance was lost. We lost it. We accepted the fake, the plastic throwaway when we could have held out for the real thing. I'm not an antique lover, but you know how moving it can be to use or handle some object which has been handled by other people in generations before you. I've got a stone axe on my desk at home, not for self-defense, but <laughs> just for pleasure. My father used to keep it on his desk. Makes a good paperweight. It's New Stone Age. I don't know how old it is. It could be anything from a few centuries to 12,000 years. It's partly polished and it's partly left rough. It's very finely shaped. It's well made. When you pick it up, you can't help but think of the human hands polishing that granite. There's a sense of solidity and community in the touch and the feel of that ax to me. There's nothing sentimental about it. It's just the opposite. It's a real experience of time, which is our most inward dimension, and which is so difficult to experience consciously, but without which we're completely disoriented in this, what seems so familiar, external dimensions of space. 
If that makes any sense, that's what I'm trying to say about the real work of art. Like a stone axe, it's there. It stays there. It's solid, and it involves the inward dimension. It may be wonderfully beautiful, and may be quite commonplace and humble, but it was made to be used and to last. Hack work is not made to be used, it's made to be sold. It's not made to last, it's made to wear out and be replaced. And I think that's the difference between art and entertainment on one hand and trash on the other. When Ted Sturgeon made up his law, he was simply responding to contemptuous, ignorant critics of science fiction who really didn't deserve so clever an answer. But his law has been used so much as a defense and an excuse and a cop-out. I suggest that we in science fiction stop quoting it for a bit. I'd like this not to be resigned, but to be rebellious. Not cynical, but critical and idealistic. I'd like to hear us say 95% of science fiction is trash. Yuck! Let's get rid of the stuff. Let's open the windows and get rid of the garbage. Here we've got science fiction, the most flexible, adaptable, broad range, imaginative, crazy form that prose fiction has ever attained. And we're going to let it be used for making toy plastic ray guns that break when you play with them, and prepackaged, pre-cooked, pre-digested, indigestible, flavorless TV dinners, and big inflated rubber balloons containing nothing but hot air. Well, I say the hell with that. I think what our statue of science fiction needs to do is to use his eagle eyes to look at himself. A long, thoughtful look, critical look. We don't have to be defensive anymore. We aren't children or untouchables. Like it or lump it, we're now adult, active members of society. And as such, I think we have a challenge to meet. We've got to stop skulking around playing by ourselves like the kid everybody picks on. When a science fiction book is reviewed in a fanzine or a literary review, it should be compared with the rest of current literature, like any other book, and placed among the rest on its own individual merits. When a science fiction book is criticized in print or in a class, it should be criticized as hard as any other book, as demandingly, with the same expectations of literacy and solidity and complexity and craftsmanship. When a science fiction book is read, I wish it could be read as a novel or a short story, a work in the traditions of Dickens and Chekhov, not as an artifact from the pulp factory. The reader should expect we'd bring, but it wasn't like this in 1935. And finally, when a science fiction book is written, the writer really ought to be aware that he or she is in an extraordinarily enviable position, an inheritor of the least rigid, the freest, the youngest of all literary traditions, and therefore should do the job just as well and as seriously and as entertainingly, as intelligently and as passionately as ever it can be done. That is the least we can ask of our writers, and the most. You cannot demand of an artist that he produce a masterpiece, but you can ask that he try. It seems to me that science fiction is standing right now in a doorway. The door is open, wide open. Aren't we going to stand here waiting for the applause of the multitude? It won't come. We haven't earned it yet. Are we going to cringe back into the old safe ghetto room and pretend there isn't any big bad multitude out there? If so, our good writers will leave us in despair, as we heard about this afternoon, and there will not be another generation of them. Or are we going to walk on through the doorway and join the rest of the city? I do hope so. I know we can and I hope we do because we have a great deal to offer to art which needs new forms like ours, to critics who are sick of chewing over the same old words, and above all to the readers of books who want and deserve better novels than they mostly get. But it'll take not only courage for science fiction to join the community of literature, it'll take strength and self-respect and a will not to settle for the second rate. It'll take genuine self-criticism and it will include genuine praise. You know, if you think secretly or openly that you're second rate, that you're 95% trash, then however much you praise yourself in your in-group, it doesn't really mean much. It's like adolescent boasting, which often reveals this horrible feeling of worthlessness. 
I do think science fiction is pretty well grown up now. We've been through our illiterate stage, and we've been through our latent or non-sexual stage, and we've been through the stage when you can't think of anything but sex, and all the rest of the stages, and really we do seem to be on the verge of maturity now. Lee Harding doesn't like the word, but... <laughs> And when I say I'd like science fiction to be self-critical, I don't mean pedantic or destructively perfectionist. I just mean I'd like to see more science fiction readers, fans, critics, whatever, judging soundly, dismissing failures quietly in order to praise successes joyfully, to go on from them, to build on them. That's what maturity is, I guess, a, a just assessment of your capacities and the will to fulfill them. And we do have plenty to praise, you know. I think science fiction during the past 10 or 15 years has produced some books and stories that will last, that will be meaningful and beautiful many years from now. It seems to me we can grow and change and welcome growth and change without losing our solidarity. Because the solidarity of the science fiction community is a really extraordinary thing. It makes the lives of fans much richer and more complicated, as I can see. For the writers, it can be an incredible boon. The support, the response a science fiction writer gets from his readers is really unique. Most novelists, you know, get nothing like that. They're quite isolated. Their response comes from paid reviewers and review services. And if they're bestsellers, then they're totally isolated from genuine response by this enormous mechanism of salesmanship and publicity and success. What fandom, what, what the science fiction community gives the science fiction writer, or at least this is my own experience, is I think the best modern equivalent of the old small-scale community, the old city-state, like Florence was in the Renaissance, within which most of the finest art forms developed and flourished, a community not too big, not too small, of intensely interested people, a ready audience, ready to discuss and to defend and to attack and to argue with each other and with the artist to the irritation and the entertainment and the benefit of them all. So when I say the ghetto walls are down and that it behooves us to step over them and be free, I don't mean that the community of science fiction is breaking up or should break up. I hope it doesn't. I think it won't. I don't see why it should. The essential lunacy that unites us will continue to unite us. The one thing that, that has changed is that we're no longer forced together into a mutually defensive posture like a circle of musk oxen on the Arctic snow attacked by wolves, you know, by the contempt and arrogance of literary reactionaries. If we meet now and in the future, we writers and readers of science fiction, to give each other prizes and see each other's faces and renew old feuds and discuss new books and hold our celebration, it will be in entire freedom because we choose to do so, because, to put it simply, we like each other. Thank you very much.